let's give them a sec to, to get a seat. This is the useless stuff. It's all this, pretty much everything. Uh, zoom. May I start? Yeah, please. Okay, thanks. Well, um, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's like a nice coincidence, I would say that. Uh, first time I came to Trieste was in 2017 when I was teaching these uh, similar topics, but on uh, Kodata summer school. So it was summer. It was a little, little bit better, I would say. Uh, but I mean, it's always a pleasure to come and see people um, on the other side of the city, let's say. Well, actually, now I moved in Trieste. So. Um, what I'm going to tell you is a little bit about how we can use computational models to maybe should we close the chat on the or yeah I can oh I can do it myself sorry or maybe I can just go for this yeah that would work right um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about computational modeling of uh, cancer sequencing data. What's the pointer? Um, so this is something that essentially, from the point of view of quantitative, it's uh, all about, does it work? No, it doesn't. Okay, I can probably move my, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm gonna discuss essentially how we can use computational modeling techniques to understand tumors and therefore I'm focusing on what is something that we usually call computational oncology. That's just a new field that uh, has emerged and I think it's like very uh, interesting, at least in my opinion, because there is a lot of technological development around that and therefore there is the need for people that can understand um, the the data, the models, they can write it on a computer, they can, you know, there is the need of people like you guys, like us, I would say that, you know, can make sense of this complex uh, data. In this um, introduction, so I'm gonna start giving a brief introduction of what we do as a lab. We are based in Trieste, well, you probably know the place. This is like nice, despite being a small place, uh, it has a lot of interesting things, including super strong, uh, um, you know, winds compared to the average parts of Italy. Uh, we are pretty much close now, no, to this to this castle. And um, yeah, we are a small lab. We started a couple of years ago, but I think we're growing faster. So we're a big derivative, I would say. And uh, in general, we have we're always on the lookout for interesting people. Whenever we have grants and money, things go quite well these days. So you might have some interest in getting in touch with us. What we do for a living is essentially uh, drawing these kind of things on the blackboard, which are, um, you know, the concepts of tumor evolution, which I'm gonna to introduce to you over this set of lectures, at least at the uh, beginning level. And then we, we, we do some mathematical models and we do some inference from the data to try to see if our hypothesis makes sense in terms of, uh, um, you know, the signals we expect to see in the data. It's really about drawing these kinds of things on the blackboard pretty much every, every, every day. Um, we have a team of interdisciplinary people and uh, I want to show you just like some of the people we do. What's new in Chrome? Yeah, we have data that. So we got like a number of people that have some are like physicists so they come from uh, hardcore theoretical physics. Uh, some former CISA people actually. And then we have a number of PhD students. We they come from different kind of uh, angles, right? We have people that know 
um, quantitative biology and genomics by, by background, but then they specialized in as a master's in data science. And then we have pure data scientists, computational people. So there is a number of people that provide different insights on the problem because we really try to make uh, interdisciplinary research um, because we don't really just want to work on the you know computational problem per se. We really want to try to make some impact uh, in terms of real biology and also clinical practice in some way, because at the end of the day, we are st studying a human disease. So we want to, to, to have an handle on, on that as well. And most of these people are sometimes also co-supervised with uh, several uh, other, other scientists in Trieste or around. What we do for a living is actually um, developing uh, a number of uh, tools that we always release to the public domain. So um, we have uh, these uh, packages, which are going, some of them are going to be discussed over the next lectures. So most of them are developed in, uh, in, uh, in R, or sometimes they have some Python behind, but pretty much we do everything in R. So all the practicals of my lectures will be done using the R programming language. So please try to get it installed on your computer. If you have questions, you can ask and write me an email or something, but just like come with our studio for the next lecture so that we can do some uh, practical analysis instead of doing, so we do the talking today and then we go for the practicals over the next uh, uh, lectures. And uh, you are invited to go and have a look at all these kind of packages that they have their own websites, sorry. Uh, that's the right link. They're all available on GitHub. They have their own websites. Um, they have articles that explain you how you can um, plot data. There is example data. How you can fit uh, the models. Pretty much everything is in the form of well-documented uh, material. So you, if you're curious and you want to work more on these kind of topics, you have a lot of materials you can um, start from. Okay. So what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to do with you these days is instead give you well uh, an introduction to all the, the all the fuzz about uh, computational oncology and what I think are the most interesting things from a quantitative point of view as well. Are there any questions at this point? Please feel free to interrupt me anytime. Uh, I know you have different backgrounds. Um, I'm gonna start from the most simple things uh, and then we will build on top of that. Essentially, the, um, we're gonna revolve around three main areas. First one is explaining you what is cancer genomics, which might be a little boring if people have a background in neuroscience, but it might be important for people that have a background in physics to have an idea, for instance, of what does it mean uh, to talk about sequencing? What does it mean to have uh, read counts from sequencing experiments? What does it mean to have DNA mutations or unemployed in kind of concepts which are like the bread and butter of people that work on the, in the field of uh, computational ecology, but they are not necessarily immediately um, obvious for, for all the other people. And then from the point of view of uh, probably you heard a lot of buzzwords regarding you no know, mutations during COVID, there is the new variant, blah, 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 blah. That there is evolution of this variant and now is all the, I don't know what variant are we with these days, but you know, I think that at the end of uh, probably this lecture, you'll have a little bit more of an idea. What does it mean to have a mutation, a mutation fixation, a population and things like that, which is exactly what we do when we think of tumors as an evolutionary process, which is the other side of this set of uh, lectures. So discussing the concept of clone expansions, how we can use mutations, which come from cancer genomics perspective to understand the clone evolutionary process that is behind the formation of the disease that is behind of the and responsible for how disease responds to treatment and so on and so forth. And we're gonna have the four to call into cause concepts like null model of neutral evolution and some form of selection at least. So you'll have an idea about general idea about evolutionary processes. And at the end of the day, we're going to build on top of this concept to have our model to make some inferences based on cancer sequencing data, because what we want to do at the end is to make some, you know, reasonable 
uh, analysis of this data and trying to understand tumors as evolutionary processes because that's what they are and that's the only way of giving them a dynamical flavor so understanding them as the dynamical process that changes over time because it's a disease characterized of course by uh, this kind of dynamical uh, behavior does it make sense cool just to let you give you some heads up for from the point of view of uh, um, from the point of view of um, uh, the kind of machine learning that people do in this kind of field, most of it is some form of unsupervised learning that looks like clustering in some sense, you know, so putting colors on top of points. As you see example on, on the top left, you have this bunch of points that are black and you want to make them colored and, you know, make some understanding of these colors. In, in, in terms of this evolutionary process. And then you might have also the andrograms or things like this. When we think about phylogenies, probably, right? This might be a concept that most of you might be a little bit uh, at least uh, familiar with. So essentially, um, there is no just, I don't know if it's going to let you down, but there's not going to be any deep learning or any things like that in, in, what, in what we do, uh, mostly because I, I, I in some way, I think that the kind of problems we, we want to solve are slightly different is really more uh, about uh, trying to find some structures in our data in, in a way that we can understand the process, making some assumptions about the structures and, and, and looking at the data from the point of view of what is the latent structure of, of, uh, of, the, of the, of in this case, going to be about the, the, the cancer practically. But there is no things like, uh, I don't know, training, uh, a model over 35 million uh, images of this or that. So it's a kind of a different field, right, in some way, also because we don't necessarily have these huge training sets, no? Luckily, because otherwise there would be like millions of people uh, with the disease. So it's a little bit, uh, and there are millions of people, by the way, but anyway, um, it's a different kind of concept from, I don't know, image recognition or other stuff, even though there is some deep learning and especially in people that do things like variational autoencoders uh, in the context of single cell sequencing, et cetera, which is probably something might be discussed by Catalina Vallejos in these lectures. She does mostly a lot of single cell stuff as far as I understand, while I'm more the genomics guy in the context of cancer and there is Gabrielle on the epigenomics. So there is, I think it's a nice school because you get to see different type of uh, stories, right? So let's start putting uh, the disease into context. So the application, we want to do data science. So we want to focus on why we do this thing, right? Which I think it's always a good, uh, a good start. Um, it's a predominant disease in the sense that it has, uh, of course, a strong diffusion. It's a, uh, it has some form of equity in the sense that it hits from the richest to the poorest people because the disease that can essentially uh, be motivated by the basics functioning of cells and, uh, uh, and the formation of organs and tissues. So it's something that is really prevalent across uh, all the individuals. Of course, it has a, uh, an incidence that is spatially different across different countries because it has also some relation to lifestyles and uh, therefore habits of people so it has this kind of environment component there is also a very strong genetic um, uh, there is a very strong genetic uh, explanation of how this disease comes so it also has relation to uh, is it adjusted for uh, uh, life expectancy that's a very good question. I, I, I don't know because I didn't do this picture myself. I took it from Google Cancer Incidents Map Worldwide, something like that. That was, that's where I stopped. Um, but uh, I have something that might, might, might connect to your question in the next slides. It has an incidence that depends, so not all the... You know, there is a bias based on sex, so some you know people get tend to get tumors of a certain type, tumor of another type, and you will see that, for instance, um, even the rate of mortality is different across tumor types. So they're not necessarily all of the same severity, I would say, 
but there is a huge variety of tumor types. There is pretty much every different, every different type of cell in the human body can lead to a cancer. So there are roughly 200 different types of cancers. Some are more common than others. Some are more related to environmental factors. Some are more biased to heat on males or females. Of course, breast cancer is more a characteristic for, for women rather than men, even though also a man can get breast cancer. So there are... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, different things, of course, but prostate definitely comes to a man. So, you know, of course, there is some specificity to the individual. And um, what is interesting is that um, we are doing better at um, understanding and, uh, and the disease and, uh, and sorry, understanding um, this disease and treating this disease. So there are like huge improvements in terms of the way we develop the drugs and we use them to, 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 to treat cancer patients, uh, even though of course there is a, um, it's still a kind of a, one of the most uh, uh, prevalent diseases of mankind these days. It's not the first cause of death in the world, but it's I think one of the top three, the first one is should be heart condition. So this position third, but it's, it's really important. And it's really fascinating because it's difficult to understand and also because it relates to basic functioning of cellular processes. And so something we can um, think about and we can try to measure with, with sequencing uh, data. As you see here, for instance, there is a very high rate, increased rate of um, death rates by lung cancers that, you know, you would probably uh, speculate that this correlates with diffusion of smoking habits uh, in, around the world, right? So you see this kind of uh, signals that are most likely uh, telling us how much environment can somehow influence the probability of, uh, of the disease in some, uh, in some way. But things are going better in the sense that there is decay trend for, for a number of um, tumor types. So it's a disease where we're doing better. It's still very important. So it's very, still very uh, under the spotlight, I would say. So let me try to bring you inside the world of what we, uh, what are the main ingredients we need to think about if we want to uh, do this kind of um, machine learning and data science. So what is... What is our interpretation of DNA in the context of the disease? What role does it play? Why that is important? And um, so we will have to go from the idea of DNA mutations and eventually measurements, which is going to be the thing we're gonna use to develop our, our models. So um, just like a quick recap, this should be uh, something familiar pretty much for uh, all of us, uh, we have chromosomes that constitute our genetic uh, material. We have uh, 23 chromosomes, two copies each. Uh, all of them are surrounded by things like chromatin, um, which is probably the thing that, I don't know what Gabrielle explained to you, but she was probably talking about chromatin, right? Or things like that. So that's the epigenetics part of the story um, that wraps around uh, nucleosome and histone. So this is just the way the DNA molecule folds itself. Um, it's in the form of a helix, we know that. But what comes as important for us, it has this sequence of nucleotides, which are bases that determine the, the actual material which is stored inside the, the DNA molecule. It's uh, important because this molecule, not all of it, but about 2% of that is covered up by genes which are the piece of information that encodes for proteins. So pretty much 98%, 99% of the genome is, um, is called non-coding because it does not contain genes. The, the, the small bits contains the genes and the genes are the most important things because the genes are what actually produces the proteins. And the proteins are the things that make the actual functioning of the of the individual of the organism right all all the interesting stuff is carried out by uh, by the proteins in the process of production of the protein by the dna which is something that's very complex and goes through the intermediate product of rnas is 
you can think of this as a process of going from a computer program, which is the DNA, something where I've written all the information that I want to write, in compiling this computer program and running this computer program, which is going to the executable, which is the making of the protein, right? So one is like the recipe of your, you know, your, your pasta dish you want to do. And the other thing is the actual pasta dish that you're going to eat tonight. So things can go bad in cooking and things can go bad, bad in doing proteins as well. And in fact, when we talk about the presence of mutations, we mean somatic mutations in this content, in context mostly, we refer to the fact that we might have changes inside the sequence of nucleotides, maybe most of these changes will just make nothing or will be completely influential to the final outcome of the, of the, of the proteins, if you want to just put it as simple as that. But some of these changes are going to be important in the sense it might impair the production of protein or they might lead proteins to have different shapes. And if you probably heard of these things like alpha fold, this kind of deep learning prediction of protein structure, et cetera, what makes most of the structure, sorry, what makes the functioning of a protein is the shape of the protein. So the way it comes up folded, as I always say, it's what gives it a certain function because it's just like a kind of uh, mechanic process that things attach one to the other. So if you fold it in a different way, you might have uh, a different function for the protein. So some of the mutations, not all of them, but some of the mutations, but be such that the protein doesn't fold in the same way. And therefore you might have misfunction of the proteins associated. And essentially, this is one of the reasons things start going bad in a certain way. You might say, well, you know, just let's, let's invent some way of removing mutations. That would be a very bad idea because mutations are the things that create diversity, right? And we are all similar one another, but we're not exactly alike, right? So the difference between me and you is just probably some millions of mutations out of a 3 billion molecule, sorry, nucleotide molecules. So not really that many, but, you know, it, it makes a huge difference. So the, one of the fundamental ingredients to create evolution is to allow for variation, right? And so mutation needs to be there. Don't come up with crazy ideas about removing that because that would be very problematic. So consider that there is a fundamental difference relative to epigenetics, for instance, right? Because here we're talking about making one modification inside the DNA molecule of one cell, and then this has profound implication over all the behavior of the cell. Because the basic step that happens during the growth of a lineage, which is a set of cells that come out of an original cell, of an ancestor cell, is the fact that when cells divide, they copy their genetic material. So you have a very simple process in which you start from one cell and you go to two cells here and things go I'm gonna make things in a very simple way, but you want to go from a certain genetic material in one cell to two daughter cells that have exactly the same genetic material. That's the mathematical way of seeing cell growth, right? But the reality is very different from that in the sense that this process can be complicated in the sense that maybe I should keep a zoom uh, here on the on the blackboard if I draw something. How can I is there any is this? I don't know, it may because I think the camera takes the full room, but maybe if we focus it. Yeah. You want to make this bigger. Yeah no to focus this on the blackboard otherwise they don't see right probably. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna use it much but if I do no, no, I mean, like, really zooming. Ah, there you go. Yeah, wow. that thing. Yeah, okay. Like, this is fine. Thanks. So, yeah, sure. I'll do it myself. 
no worries and i'm gonna go for this okay this makes sense cool so we have uh, this process that of cell division which is very important because every time that these things happen all this color stuff every time these things happen if you have a particular mutation in the position of the genome this mutation is going to be uh, passed along to the next uh, generation of cells right so that's the difference between in a very simple way between genetic and epigenetics in the sense that by genetic changes we refer to something which is usually heritable and therefore it keeps to remain over time if this is your time dimension it keeps remaining over time while epigenetics might be something that is revertible so after a little bit of time this thing might not be still anymore there but one of the things that happens is also that on top of these whenever you have this process that requires to create genetic material so duplicate genetic material it's not a perfect process in the sense that there might be new mutations coming out over these populations and this will be present from one generation onward right so you have this continuous process of mutation generation over the creation of uh, um, cellular populations and as you can see from panel over there this kind of x is the mutation that is present in the orange cell and then this one gets y so the, the blue cell has both x and y right and the green one gets x and z so you have this kind of idea of a genotype as a combination of matrices that come sorry uh, mutations that comes out um, you know as time progresses it comes out uh, as more and more complicated right one of the key things you should keep in mind is that in the context of this particular disease there is no way of getting a cancer with just one somatic mutation there is no way of getting that complex disease by just one mutation it's not like certain there are diseases in which it's just enough to have one mutation and that's that'd be enough to to get the disease i think cystic fibrosis is one of them but in the context of the disease things are if disease things are a little bit more complicated you always need to have multiple type of mutations one on top of the other which justifies the the drawing i was doing just before in order to uh, get to the final disease there is no single gene mutation that can cause a cancer there are some you know preferential type of mutations for the cancer and they often depend on what on the cell of origin of the disease so tumors in the lung they look a little bit different from tumors in the colon that's the latent structure in the population we were discussing uh, before right but in a very simplistic way uh, there was this uh, there is this kind of view for instance in the context of colorectal cancer which is one of the most famous ones in which you have these passages that go from the the normal epithelium so the normal cells of the tissue to the actual carcinoma which is the official cancer thing that are all caused by the subsequent accumulation of mutations impairing the functioning of important genes like apc keras um, smart 2 for p53 so probably some of you that already work on sequencing and stuff they heard these names like t53 is the most famous it's called the guardian of the genome so some of them are very important and it's, it is believed that the mutations in these genes they cause important changes to the phenotype of the cancer cells for instance mutations in this apc gene are responsible for the switch from the normal epithelium to the early adenoma which is the the kind of classical formation we see that comes out a little bit out of the normal epithelium it grows like 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 a simple a small mushroom in some way right and the more it grows 
the more, sorry, the, sorry, the more mutations you get, the more this structure become complicated with the final end point of giving you the metastasis, which is just the way that tumors use to move from one organ to another organ, right? You get a metastasis on the liver from a primary tumor in the, in the colon. So there is this kind of progressive uh, accumulation of somatic mutations in which more and more advantageous genomes get selected by a Darwinian evolutionary process. And I'll try to explain this over the next uh, um, set of slides. Does it make sense so far? Okay. So one of the things, which is the technology, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a question about what you said before. The analogy made from like computer code, like moving mm. from source code, and mm. and so basically, you, you, these mutations are like breakage, like corruption of source code that could lead to breakage of the. It's a bug in a computer. Yeah, sure. Some, this is my very sense. computational yeah. way of putting it down. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and also before you mentioned like epigenetics and how they are not inheritable. But that, that's not, not always the case. No, that, that would be like- I not, think... Sure. I mean, well, it might be that epigenetic changes are also heritable for certain, for long time windows also, yeah. right? Yes. But so, it's more like here you are, once that molecule is broken, all the progeny gets the error as well, right? So it might happen that if you break it too much, this kind of cell dies because you're impaired it so much, the basic function of the cell that it has to die. But in some way, if it survives, it's going to carry over this legacy of mutation that comes from. It's not necessarily true what I'm saying. There might be a way okay, in okay. which you lose some mutation, etc. But it's, it's, it's perfectly fine to assume that this does not happen. While the epigenetic methylation, for instance, of a promoter of a gene, is something you can lose over time, right? Yeah. So, so what or you're not in compactation, right? So, your kind of analysis, you, you always only consider genetic mutations, not... Uh... Well, in the context of understanding tumors as, um, as, a, as, a, as an evolutionary process, you need to have a barcode that tells what is the history of the process and mutations are your barcode, basically. Okay. Uh, I'm asking this because I was thinking about some works I've seen recently where people have seen that, for example, if you compare uh, chemo-resistant tumors uh, versus non-chemo-resistant tumor cells, you see some distinct difference in, in, the, in the chromatin structure, for example. If you look at the system mutilation, you see a difference. Yeah. So it appears that, that one, there's like epigenetic factors that drive also like- No, the, no, of course, I'm not saying. So uh, for instance, people, there's, there's a lot of dissing in the community. Yeah. I'm right, you're wrong. And also genetics versus epigenetics is one of those things. They play both of them an important role. The classical view of tumor evolution comes from the genetic side, but now it's adapting to accommodate also epigenetic evolution. It's just much more difficult to study even mathematically because of this fact that this is not stable over time. In my opinion, this makes mathematics sometimes extremely complicated. Uh, but uh, yes, there is you know, good reasons to believe it, both one and the other. Both, both of them play a different role. It makes sense to start to think about the genetics perspective to begin with, because that's a simpler one. Uh, hi. So, um, so there you uh, in one of the slides you showed uh, one stage of cancer progressing to the other stage, mm -hmm. and each associating with one specific mutation. Yeah. Uh, so when you say that uh, there is no single mutation causing cancer, is it that each of these steps need to have at least multiple mutations or is that? No, what, what, what I meant by that is that so let's, let's just go try to use this kind of cartoon representation on top of that. That means that these cells carry the mutation on APC and these cells carry both the mutation on APC and KRAS, mm -hmm. right? So this is like something that is, is been believed to be true. I don't think it's actually true. We have a lot of reasons to believe that this is not necessarily true, but here it means that there is a preferential route to acquire this final endpoint of the disease that consists in acquiring as a cumulative kind of effect, a cumulative fitness effect, acquiring multiple mutations. All of them will be inside the same cell at some point. 
Okay. Uh, but can there be like single mutations which prime cells towards their path to carcinogenesis? So sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, can there be single mutations which prime cells towards their path to tumorigenesis? Uh, for example, here, uh, just if assuming that this is true, uh, if there's an APC mutation which leads to an early adenoma, can mm -hmm. we? It, it's still there's no going back from early adenoma to normal epithelium, right? Uh, so okay. one of the fundamental things, as I was saying, is that you don't really revert back to the wild type. That would be, yes, that would be one of them. So you would not go back to the, to the early healthy tissue, I would say, general. But to progress farther, you need to get an extra mutation. Mm -hmm. Thinking about as um, necessary, not sufficient condition to progress to the next step. Sometimes people think about that in, in terms of that. Okay, Respect. thanks. Okay. What I'm trying to give is like um, um, a view of this process, which is not perfect, but is true enough to, to make what we have to do, right? So there are a lot of more complicated things and special cases in which you can actually lose the mutations, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm just curious, is one mutation of these has high derivative to a to derive other mutation, other mutations. What do you mean high derivative? Like, does it like improve the possibility? This is like a very difficult question. I'm not sure I can answer yes or no. So okay. your question is like, does the probability of a mutation increase given another mutation? Yeah, to like to arrive to this this uh, yeah. stable state of metastasis. Um, I would say, for instance, no, from a Darwinian point of view, because the probability of a mutation should be independent of fitness advantage of that mutation. Okay. It's selection that selects things, right? Okay. Okay. But I mean, this was really a fantastic question. Too difficult. Just this one, the first one. Um, just uh, like yeah. a comment on what she asked. I'm, uh, I think like if there are mutations in, say, uh, genes uh, responsible for DNA repair, yeah, then, but this is a different story. Yeah, I didn't yeah. go there. So there is some, for instance, biological mechanism that is responsible for the, let's say, the very naive probability of getting these mutations when you divide. Of course, if these mutations impairs one of those genes, you might have an increased rate of mutations over time. So in some sense, yes. But I think she, I think she meant in a more broad type of way. Yeah. As I said, like the truth level I'm positioning myself is enough to be not too false, not too, yeah. not too useless, right? Otherwise, <laughs> and also I'm not a biologist, so. Can I move forward? Okay. So what we actually do when we sequence, right? We extract DNA from our cells. The kind of technology I'm going to refer to is bulk sequencing. Did Gabriel tell you anything about that? No. Essentially, the idea is that we pull, we take our cells. We have a bunch of cells here, right? And each one of them has their genetic material inside the DNA. We, we extract all of it and we pull it together inside, uh, you know, some tube or anything. And we put it inside in a machine that spits out short fragments of this DNA, no? The DNA comes out in short fragments. The length of the fragments depend on the technology we use. The amount of fragments depend on the money we put in the experiment. And the quality of these things depends also on the technology because sometimes, for instance, the, the machine has some kind of error probability, right? Per nucleotide. But each one of these things is essentially a small view, 200 nucleotides, for instance, of one DNA molecule. One of the things we should observe immediately is that we don't have any information to map these back to these cells. Because this is like taking you know, a lot of different fruits and making a big smoothie, right? You have no idea that oh, you can see how oh, this must be some bananas flavor, right? But you cannot really, it's not invertible as a function, right? You get the read and where it does come from, you have no idea. While there are other technologies in which you can actually instead barcode each one of them. And so you can assign the cells to the cell, to the cell sorry, the reads, the segments of the cell of origin. That's called single cell stuff. 
It has a completely different type of performance. It can be used for different type of things. It's not what we're going to discuss in these lectures. We're going to focus instead on these short fragments, sorry, on bulk sequencing. It's called bulk because you make this bulk of cells where you get these reads. And what you actually do, what a bioinformatician does for a living, the classical bioinformatician spends his life taking all these things and putting them on top of what is called the reference genome, which is the thing on top here, aligning them. The bioinformatician aligns reads, most likely. That's the classical view of bioinformatics. That's not what we do as a lab. We have to do it to get to our interesting data for the evolutionary inferences we want to do, but that's 100% part of the process. And I'm not going to discuss this, but it's also a complicated problem because it requires, you know, the, the, the finding the, the right position for each one of these uh, short segments. And as you can imagine, if the segments are short, they might map to different positions of the genome. So it's kind of complicated as well, right? There's a question from the back. This is a, this is a very good question. I, I can repeat, yeah, sure. The question is like, do we sequence all the genome? That's a very good question. Let me like, just make a drawing. I removed that slide this morning, but yeah. So let's say this is the whole genome. Let's say this is the coding part of the genome. This will be like 2%, right? We said 2% of it, a small part. Sometimes we do this. We sequence these things and we call this whole exome. That's the name of the technology that we use for sequencing. Other times we do whole genome we sequence all of it, or other times even we do something smaller. So we look inside of the exome, of all the exome, we look at some targeted panel. What do you think is the difference? The cost, right? It's always about money at the end of the day, because this thing is really, really small, this 2% of this. So if you want to cover your genome with all these reads, no? If you have that you need to get many to cover all of it, you will require more than what you can, you know, just to cover 2% of that, okay? But there is a fundamental difference. According to what you want to do, you might require to work with the full genome or only a targeted part of the genome, right? So that really comes at the point in which you need to decide what is my question, and then I do the experimental design in a way that I can answer my question. Many people come to me always and say, like, I've done this. Can I answer this question? And most likely I say no, because you should have done that. So one of the cool things is that we are also involved in experimental design. No? I want to make this statement about this process. What should I measure, right? That's where I start the science, basically while sometimes it does not go that way. But this is a really good question. What we're going to discuss in these lectures is this kind of sequencing. We are gonna have like a full genome. And the reason is that the statistical signal we're going to look for is distributed across all the genome. And you will see it in the practicals. In which way can you just decide to sequence a part of the genome? That's a very good question. Uh, I'm not a wet lab scientist, but they use primers to cut the DNA in certain positions. So that's how you do it. Essentially, once you extract the DNA, you always, I mean, you can't choose what you extract. You get all of it, right, basically. But then you can reach to select certain areas over others, basically. Say it again. It is known where it is located, but it's spread across all the chromosomes, right? So some genes are on chromosome one, are on chromosome two, are on chromosome three. It's not like in one position. So it's spread all over the place. But once we have taken our reads and we have done our bioinformagic thing, so aligned all the reads, what do we have is essentially a reference sequence 
So what we think is the, let's say, average human in some way, we have this mean field human in some way, which is a sequence of nucleotides. We really do have that. It's called, yeah, and it changes periodically. We update what our belief about this, uh, this reference. And then we can look at all of our reads and check if there is any difference from the nucleotide we were expecting to find at a certain position and the actual, sorry, a difference between nucleotide we found at a certain position in A and the actual expectation about the nucleotide that should be a G. That would be a mutation found inside one of these reads that we know it comes from one of these cells. Which one? We don't know, right? But the kind of quantity we pay the money for and the kind of quantity we use to make what we're going to do in our lectures is the variant allele frequency. So it's the ratio between the number of reads that come up with the variant, so the number of reads that come up with an A here, and the overall number of reads we can pile up at a certain locus. So here we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight reads as total coverage. That's how we call it, the coverage, this green thing here. And one, two, three, four reads with the mutation. So the variant analytic frequency will be exactly 50%. And because we have a, a huge molecule with 3 billion bases, the DNA, essentially we're going to have like potentially thousands of these values for a full genome. Does it make sense? So this is just another way of representing that, right? In this case, it will be like this blackish thing is the read with the somatic SNV. This is terminology you might want to get familiar with is called a single nucleotide variant. So all we do is about the mathematics we do, the inference we do, is all about the variant frequency spectrum that we can measure through a sequencing experiment. All the secrets we want to get away from our cancer is all about relating how this kind of spectrum changes over time as the disease progresses. Does it make sense? Cool. And if you are not rich, because this thing costs a lot, consider that generating a full genome, let's say with a coverage of 100 reads per position of the genome on average, it costs some thousand dollars. So it's not really cheap if you want to make like, I don't know, hundreds of samples. You have the lucky that you can actually get this data sometimes for free from a lot of public databases, which is always helpful, especially if you are you know, starting and you want to get your hands dirty without spending the money, right? So. Uh, in this, uh, um, comparing these values, uh, um, am I uh, correct uh, that uh, you are going to have some time slices and in each time you have different reads and find these values because the different are changing over time. So how we can say this measure and changing of this measure can be a sign for growing the cancer. This is a good point. I should have put it probably in a slide on this. So most likely we don't have longitudinal data. We don't have multiple observations over time. Most likely we don't. We usually have a single snapshot of the process. Still, I'll show you, we can get an idea of what's going on even with a single snapshot of the process. Why do we have a single one? There are many reasons, right? Some are practical reasons of collecting data from patients means like chopping up you know, tissues out of patients, out of people, right? But sometimes we actually have a temporal dimension. So we, we are correct in saying that sometimes we are able to collect things over time. So we have also 
you know, a time label, T1, T2, et cetera, et cetera. But other times we do something else instead. We chop a large portion of tissue and then we get our sequencing done out of different spatially separated region of our tissue. So we sequence this one, position one, position two, so on and so forth. Sometimes we also have this thing over time, okay? But, yeah, sure. Um, should I read it? Okay, that's a very good question. I omitted to, to go into the detail of that. Um, when I was saying that, uh, but this is a good point. When I was saying that uh, we extract the DNA out of all our cells, I didn't make any statement about whether they're tumor or normal cells, right? So most likely you will be collecting also normal cells. So some of these reads will be coming also from normal cells. And in this actual uh, presentation here, this contamination thing, refers to the fact that some of these reads come out of normal cells. So the variant allelic frequency is not adjusted, it's not normalized for tumor content, is what we say, because it's just like the overall fraction of reads observed in the sample. So we cannot distinguish, but we can do normalize, which we're going to do in the practicals when we, when we work with real data. It's, it's a very good question. But the, the notion of variant allelic frequency is just the notion of a variation at a specific genomic locus. That's what this uh, notation this, this notation means, yes. And often we have a, like a lot of samples, no? What you see here is just like the classical way people using genomics to, to make sense of this data. They try to represent it like this, right? They, they put these huge matrices where you have each one of these columns to be one patient or one sample, whatever it is. And each one of these rows is one, in this case is a gene. And the gene name you find it reported here on the left. And this different color of the alteration is the type of mutation you have seen. So what I've discussed so far is one particular type of mutation is called single nucleotide variant. There is actually many more things that can happen in some way. I don't really care about that for now. So what I think is just that we need to get away with is the fact that this kind of thing is like a binary zero one matrix if you want, okay? Rows are your matrices, so um, genes in this case, and the columns are the samples. When I came in Trieste in 2017, I told how do we analyze this? Now we do something else, sorry. <laughs> But this is the kind of data that comes to you, basically. Now we do something more fancy, more complicated. At the level of each one of these individuals, we look inside each one of these columns and we want to make a story about this particular process in each one of these columns, not across the individual. So it's not like a story about multiple patients, it's about high resolution, one single patient, okay? Or well, the group set it up here uh, is just, uh, I, th hmm? I think in this case, yes, it's a grouping of people. Um, it's not a picture that I have to bring myself. I should have put, I apologize. I should have put the reference for that. But these are like, um, so Wnt is a pathway. This will be like a functional group of genes in some way. But for instance, we see one thing immediately looking at this, right? There is a huge degree of mutual exclusivity across the mutation patterns in different individuals, right? And these are some important uh, biological implication when we look at data from different individuals. So, but let me move forward. Um, we understand there are some other mutations. We know we can sequence mutations and, uh, and therefore why didn't we solve cancer yet? That would be the natural question, right? I gave you the, the secret thing is the mutation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we have the technology to measure that. Let's do some stats and solve it. And the problem is that it just not works in a, this very simple way. Because evolution is a dynamical process. So we need to do more than looking at some other mutations. And I'm gonna to try to, to make it with a simple example. This is data from a very beautiful cohort released uh, uh, on the New England Journal of Medicine um, in 2017. 
where each one of these things you see on the top on this matrix is it, it, a little bit like the matrix you were seeing in the previous slide. Hmm? Each one of these things on the on the columns, it's um, it's um, uh, let me check. Okay, sorry, the things on the rows are somatic mutations. Yeah, I was confused. And the things on the columns are again patients, as in the previous representation. And here I'm taking all the mutations that I find in one particular patient. And I put a one if there is a mutation or a zero otherwise. And then I do some standard hierarchical clustering with trying to see if there is any structure in my data. What I want to look for is a grouping on the columns of this matrix, no? So a grouping on the thing on top here. But clearly there is no strong signal, no? There is nothing that makes good clusters in this data. So what I might decide to do is to increase the minimum frequency I want to look at and say, well, sure, let me look at mutations that happen in 5% of my cohorts, for instance. So I'm going to drop essentially rows out of this matrix, keeping the same number of columns. And still the signal is, well, there is a little bit of separation here, but things don't go very interestingly well. And then I can go on and go forth and, and increase this cutoff more and more. And eventually I can go to something that is, okay, there is a little bit more groupings, structures in my data. But to get here, I had to throw away most of my data, first of all. And also the kind of signal is a little bit disappointing, right? There is nothing particularly striking. And the reason is that there is a huge amount of noise in this kind of thing, not noise in the point of view of, noise from a technological point of view, but the fact that there is some intrinsic variability across individuals that is fundamentally part of this process, which has nothing to do with the actual function of the process, but makes it impossible to look at two data points and make them comparable on the standard classical metric space, because there is a huge number of ones that make no sense for the overall functioning of the process. So this is an important confounder, not a statistical sense confounder in a classical sense, but it is a fundamental problem in terms of what is the actual signal we should be looking at. You should do something else instead. Because it's a dynamical process, you should do something like thinking in terms of how the process happens over time, how the process evolves over time which is what we do for a living, right? We put this kind of evolutionary interpretation on top of the sequencing data, which is what I'm going to teach you over the practicals of these, of these, um, of these lectures. And if you do that on the very same type of cohort, this one here, you will see that the data will look like this. You will find this interesting, or I, I dare, any of you to tell me that this is the same kind of structure of the thing we've seen before, right? Now we have very well separated clusters where there are some features here that are uh, somehow different, right? There is much more clear and clean signal in this type of interpretation of the data. And this is done by using a computational method that we developed um, when I was in Edinburgh with Guido to think not about the particular presence of mutations in one sample, but how we can give a temporal explanation to those mutations, and how we can compare data points, not for the type of mutations that they have, but for the way they are evolving over time. So bringing in a kind of trajectory dimension in the process to compare things from the way they evolve rather than from what they look like now. Does it make sense? Yes, there is a question on the chat uh, from Beatriz. Uh, she asks, uh, do you also account for the possible... Yes, I didn't, I, didn't make any, I didn't make any distinction at this point in the sense that we, 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 use, uh, we use any somatic mutations, synonymous mutations, <laughs> non-synonymous mutations. We do use everything for the process. Uh, well, it's related to that last question. Uh, what is a silent mutation? In this case, it refers to mutations that don't have any functional effect, right? But in this case, on this uh, on this thing, what I want to to give you as 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 the point 
is that each one of these things like these edges and arrows we draw is a way of representing the process as in the cartoon I was showing before, APC, KRAS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So bringing in a temporal dimension on the explanation of each one of these things. So the method in this case, for instance, believes that in the context of this number of patients here, the one in red here, the presence, the co-presence of mutations on this gene, T53 and FAT1, it also suggests the temporal accumulation on first acquiring one mutation and then acquiring the other mutation. So it brings in a temporal dimension in the process and makes those mutations not just informative of the presence, but also of a sort of a latent clock in the process of mutation accumulation. So the main point I want to make here is that this brings in a temporal dimension in the way we think about the process. Come again. So in a sense, you have enlarged your starting that data set, adding more data that you have computed. I don't have completely understood how. No, we didn't tell you uh, how we compute that. That's, so, yeah. So it's, I have. You change from one feature space to another feature space if you want. So instead of looking at present mutation, you lift your problem to a problem of understanding the same, the same data matrix becomes a matrix of this so order. So basically, yeah. let, let me try to uh, synthesize only to, uh, to see if I understood well or not. You have uh, uh, the frequency of, of every mutation for a, pa uh, for a patient, okay? So that is a column in, in the previous chart. Right, more or less. Yeah. And basing on what you have measured, you have predicted what should be appear in a bunch of time because. I think you could also see it like that. Yes, in the sense that you can predict what is going, what might be coming next in some way. Yes, because you keep bringing a temporal dimension. So, but it's most likely the fact that you reverse time, you go time backwards in the sense that you look at the genotype today and you say this thing today came out of this thing in the past. So you try to make an educated guess of how did you get to the point where you are now? And but if you know how to do that, you also know how to predict what's coming next, right? Because the choose are just like a flip coin, basically. And so. I've not completely understood how you can uh, do this mapping, this temporal. Uh... This temporal mapping is complicated, but it's kind of practical as we're going to see, and the inferential models we're going to discuss now okay. are about putting some temporal dimension to the process. So okay. I, I hope you you'll make it. So we get isn't this it? Uh, so if you go back one slide, because you observe uh, more mutation in TP, uh, P53 than in FAT1, uh, and in all cases yeah. where you have mutation in FAT1, you have mutation in P53. That you... So there is so there is some sense in having a statistical dependency positive, like the one that you're mentioning now. No, you find a co-occurrence, and so the marginal of one is higher than the than the marginal of the other. Plus you have a quite some high joint probability, right? Which is the way in which you would, for instance, infer these kind of models as a, a Bayesian networks if you want to put an edge of dependency between those two things. But this is not the way this is done in this particular way. But this is what I taught in 2017 on the other room. So yeah, it's a good guess that you had. Um, so the kind of thing that we need to think about is that in this process, and now we get to our modeling part, in this process, we should think of the process of mutation accumulation inside one patient as having this kind of latent tree of cell divisions, like the thing I was picturing here, where most of these cell divisions, they, they create diversity, but they are not functional in the sense that all cells have the same colors and colors instead distinguish population that are different one another. So the main difference is that these first blue cells acquired some special mutation relative to its ancestor, and these green cells acquired something special relative over its ancestor. So it has some special mutation. But in between the green ones, they are all alike. They have the same, they are part of the same family of cells something we should be calling the same 
clonal population. They have different genotypes. So they have different DNA molecules because they have, every time they divide, they have different mutations. But from a functional point of view, they are exactly the same. So we could call these things phenotypes. They have different phenotypes, for instance. And the phenotype might be, in fact, the possibility of evading a drug, as you were saying, drug resistance or metastasizing. Our point is reducing the complexity of this kind of process to the evolutionary trajectory, this just subsequent set of steps by looking at the variant frequency spectrum from read count data. Does it make sense? And by the way, we have been thinking about this model since 1976 by this British scientist, which is called Noel, and this is called the clonal evolution model by uh, Peter Noel. I think it was called Peter, yeah. So the dynamics of cancer evolution, they need to be um, discussed now. And these are the general dynamics of somatic evolution. So every evolutionary process should have at least three ingredients to be discussed. Uh, the first one is mutation and drift, and then there is selection. So neutrality is a combination of mutation and drift. Mutations are the things that I was discussing before. So the probability of acquiring these mutations, which is independent of how much these mutations are functional, going back to your question. And neutrality is essentially the answer to the question, what does it happen when nothing happens, right? You have this more increased set of mutations that are accumulated inside each one of these cells. They are, they make cells different from one another, but nothing particular is happening relative to these cells. Drift is essentially the probability of, uh, you know, finding high frequency mutations, not because they're functional, but just due to the fact that they are drifting at random in a population it is usually the result of a random stochastic process in which you have like these events that happen and are become important when you have low numbers. For instance, a mutation becomes overrepresented in a population, not because it's important, but just because all the other cells in the population die for some reason, right? That's a drift type of event. So drift is random essentially. White selection depends on reproductive capacity of the cells, on the fitness of these populations. So a population that has these two important mutations should grow faster than a population that has a single important mutation. That's the idea of having these additive type of fitness models. One of the important things is that both of them reduce heterogeneity, right? In the sense that selection creates bottlenecks, right? If I have, if, you know, uh, all the, I don't know, all the daughters in Trieste will be, will, I will have all the kids of Trieste, right, in five years from now, essentially my genetic background will be enriched relative to the actual genetic background of people in Trieste now, because I underwent strong selection, right? So despite what some people might think, um, or might be the, the, the intuitive in explanation, selection reduces heterogeneity because one lineage tends to be dominant over the other lineages, right? So in the slides before, when you show this, uh, uh, even before, like um, this, this latent clonal structure and mm -hmm. phylogenetic tree that you uncover. Once you have this, how explicit is the information about you have about the various groups? Like, can you say? That's uh, what we're going to try to infer, right? Uh, we're going to take our sequencing data, yeah. and our job is going to put colors on that tree, establishing which are the colors and how many colors are there. Yeah, and then can you like say? What makes this color different from the other color? Like, then hopefully, uh, okay, okay. Hopefully, you, you will try to do that as well. Okay, thanks. So essentially, um, the difference between selection and neutrality is that selection shapes the evolutionary tree, right? The kind of thing you see on the left is a phylogenetic tree. The one you see here is completely balanced because it's neutral, while the one you see on the left here 
is unbalanced because it has been shaped by selection forces, right? So there are more offsprings of this set of cells rather than the other cells, right? The, the what basically means to undergo uh, some form of positive selection. Um, just to, because I want to, um, I want to show you evolution, right? I'm not uh, trying to, you know, I want to give you some idea that it's possible to observe the process in reality. This is a very beautiful video from, from uh, a study carried out in Harvard where uh, people have put uh, this mega Petri dish, which is this huge Petri dish, where they, it's like several feet long, where they have put different concentration of an antibiotics going left to right towards the center, right? And vice versa. So these numbers refer to the concentration unit of these antibiotics. The antibiotics is a, is a, is a barrier for the, for the population of bacteria to grow, right? Because it kills them. So here there's no antibiotic, here there's one unit and then 10 unit and so on and so forth. So this kind of uh, uh, things we're going to see now, it's evolution in real time over several weeks of growth. So there is a gradient that push things towards the middle. And you will see that this population starts growing and they hit a barrier, right? They hit a barrier over, over, um, over there pretty much where there is a first concentration of antibiotic and cells start dying. They die because they go against the bacteria. But all of a sudden, while they keep dying, they get more mutation and make them resistance to this one unit of antibiotic and they start regrowing until they, they hit the second barrier and they keep dying again, but they keep growing at the same time and acquiring more and more mutation. And eventually they can really physically create clonal expansions that you can see by eye in some way based on this continuous evolutionary process where there is a strong negative selection induced by the antibiotic. And eventually the fully resistant population manages to acquire the center of the plate where you have a thousand concentration, units of concentration of this antibiotic. And what you can do here is trace back to the cell of origin this process bacteria of origin in this process and have the evolutionary history of the process based on how things went over time. Does it make sense? This is exactly the same thing that happens inside a cancer. Each one of these divisions acquires more and more mutations. Mutations make the bacteria resistance to this antibiotic. Eventually, the super bacteria that comes out there, they are fully resistant to the antibiotic. If you want, we can think of cancer exactly in the same way, but not just cancer, evolution on this planet. Any evolutionary process should be thought of in terms of these kind of things. Evolution of species on this planet. Evolution of species on other planet, if it exists. There is a characteristic time scale of the process this process happens over two weeks time. Evolution over this planet happens over a time scale of millions, billions of years. A tumor happens on a time scale of what? Five years, 10 years, maximum the average age of you know, a human. Is a question from the back? I'd just like to, to ask what does play the role of the antibiotics? What does, what does play the role of the antibiotics in, in the body? Oh, that's a fantastic what, what question. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Cell division. Yeah, yeah I forgot to, to tell that. Like, we are complex, right? Despite the way we behave sometimes, we are complex organisms. And we have, for instance, cells that need to, um, you know, feed over a certain amount of nutrients, they need to coordinate their patterns of growth. If there is 10 sandwiches, we've got to share them, right? So that everybody gets a slice of them. A tumor is just kind of a renegade cell that starts doing whatever she wants. So you always have negative pressure towards the, uh, this kind of 
non-self cells, which is, for instance, caused by your immune system. And you can imagine these negative barriers towards tumor growth to be exactly the fact that we have acquired over millions of years of evolution, a number of mechanisms that make cellular growth essentially controlled. You don't grow tissues as much as you want, right? Instead, tumors overcome the classical mechanism we acquired during evolution to become cells that can grow in a completely uncontrolled fashion. They can feed as much as they want. They don't respond to standard mechanism of cell death. Cells are very kind to each other. One, one cell might, sell, might tell to another cell, go kill yourself. And the cell actually does kill herself, right? And a tumor cell doesn't do that, right? So they have like uh, the capacity of acquiring, uh, you know, infinite long life in some way, right? So they can do all these things. So the negative battery you can think of is the basic homeostasis of a tissue. There's a question in the chat whether the antibiotic is the same type, or only the concentration changes, or... Uh, this is the same type of antibiotic as far as I remember type. from the video. In this particular case, which depends on the bacteria and the type of antibiotic, and there is, a, is I think it's a science paper from these Harvard people, uh, you have this kind of uh, uh, gradient of the more mutations you have, the more resistance you become, which is not necessarily true in the context always of, uh, um, for instance, in cancer sometimes, or for avoid uh, uh, responding to a drug might be sufficient only even one single point mutation. So, but this was just to have a, a simple example. And also we cannot make these videos over people, right? So. Yeah, it's fundamental. This is why a lot of studies on evolution are done on bacteria because you can control the system, right? So, so let's start discussing just uh, um, to give a little bit of idea and then the statistical models will be presented in the next lectures. So we're gonna see the model and we're gonna play with it, right? So um, as I said, all our stories about the variant allelic frequency, right? So these kind of measurements will obtain from sequencing. And we have many such mutations. So essentially our data will look like a histogram of variant allelic frequencies done by taking all the mutations that are present on a genome that we have sequenced, pulling all of them together, and we're gonna reason about the colors in the phylogenetic tree, for instance, how many colors are there, what are they doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, by looking at the shape of this distribution. We're gonna predict what we want to say about the, the, the disease process. So how many, for instance, colors are there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, based on how does the site frequency spectrum looks like. So this particular type of distribution. And to do that, we're gonna bring in some ideas from mathematical modeling of evolutionary processes, which might be similar to what Thomas H is going to teach you, because I, as, I, as far as I understand, he does a lot of stem cell dynamics. So I would expect him to tell a little bit about that. And this essentially brings in the temporal dimension of uh, linear bird death stochastic processes. So something that in physics is very, is very common. And then we're gonna couple that with some observational model for a little frequencies that comes out of sequencing, so more machine learning style. And we put both of them together and we're gonna get our uh, statistical inference method that can look at sequencing data over a full genome, represented as allelic frequencies. And it's gonna tell us basically how many populations are there and if one of them is growing faster than the others, which is a little bit the question about the three I was putting before. So the resolution at which we, we can make this type of statement, it really depends on what? The resolution of our data. If there is a population of three cells out of a billion, no way, you will never see that. But if you have a billion cells and uh, some hundred millions of them, or 20% of them, 30% of them, 40% of them behave in a different way in the sense they are outgrowing the other cells, we will be able to see that. Does it make sense? 
So we can probably measure due to intrinsic technological limitations and cost of sequencing. We can't measure things that are go to the microscopic level. For that, we most likely need temporal data because something that is small here is gonna be large here, maybe. But we're gonna be able to do the kind of inference we want, at least for large populations. And to bring this in, we're gonna have to use some idea from population genetics to create a null model of evolution, plus some Dirichlet based type of models of clustering to have a nice way of accounting for, you know, probabilistic signals in our data. That's it. And then we, so this is gonna be the, the topic of the next lecture, how we do this from a single time point. And then also in the second lecture, most likely we're going to discuss the problem of how do we do this if we have multiple of these points, trying to reconcile everything together. So what I want to just give you some heads up about is the fact that the shape is what matters here, right? So maybe this thing tells a different story than this thing. And this one is also different from that. So we will have to think about how we can predict a certain shape given the clonal structure of our cancer, if we want. Okay? Questions? No, one question that made me, made me naive, uh, this thing about the shape, if you change the order of the, like if I understood correctly, these histograms you measure for every Yeah, this will position. be like, a, yeah, you have like your full genome. Yeah. You have in the same detected, I don't know, 10,000 somatic mutations. Yeah. You get the variant frequencies of these 10,000 things. Right. So it's a vector in 10,000 dimensions. Mm -hmm. And you make a histogram of that. Does it make sense? I, okay, okay, okay. Because I thought that's for like, let's say you have like 10,000 position, you, for every dose of position, you, you, you plot. No, no, that depends on the no, 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 okay, no, okay. no, 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 okay, okay. no, okay, okay. no, 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 it's clear because, um, thank you. So essentially you take your, uh, you take your reads for every position, you count the variant frequency and that's what you use. Okay. And there is a question in the chat. At which level of the mutation is it possible to identify the type of cancer among others? So glioma. Uh, at which level of the mutation is it possible to define the type of cancer among others? So um, I'm not sure I, I understand exactly what is um, at which level of the mutation. At which level of the process, probably? At which level of the process of evolution? Uh, well, usually evolution. when you collect when you collect the tumor, you collect it from uh, an organ. You already know where it comes from in some way. So I would say that probably is already in the... It, it is true that sometimes there are um, situations where this might be a little bit more difficult. And in fact, there are tumors of unknown set of origin, that's how they're called. But most likely, you know what is the organ from which you did the resection. So I think that the answer is explicit in, in your sampling of the data. So for instance, you chop off a piece of colon. And that's because you have a colon cancer. So I would say it's kind of explicit. In case of bacteria in an experiment, they die and mutate to survive. What could be an evolutionary reason for cancer progression and drug resistance? Why tumor despite can be detrimental to organ? That's a very good question. And in fact, some people might say, well, why is like, I mean, the growth of a tumor is detrimental to the host, right? In the sense that the tumor grows, but the host dies. And so it's really an evolutionary process. That might be... Um, that might be actually um, a criticism to define this as an evolutionary process. But I think that at the level of the time scale at which we, we, we look at that, so which is the lifespan of the individual, it makes sense to think of that as an evolutionary process, which is the reason I made the example of evolution over a planet over billions of years and evolution, evolution over a single person over the lifespan of uh, an individual, right? And this was like evolution over two weeks, right? So there is a characteristic time scale to the evolutionary process. Um, is VAF same as minor early frequency? No. That's something that relates to copy number events, which I'm not sure you're going to see because it would require too much um, work. But if you have um, particular questions about minor early frequencies or anything you want, you can just drop me a line. Um, 
I'm due to end up in six minutes. So I think I want to wrap up. What I'm going to just like, we want to spoil it or not? Why not? But like super fast like this. <laughs> so uh, next lecture, we're going to discuss a little bit how we look at allelic frequency and we infer some latent structure of the population. We're going to start putting down some models. You're too smart, so I need to be fast. Otherwise, you don't come to the next lecture, right? So we're going to frame the problem as a, as a density estimation problem. And then we're going to have to go back a little bit to some mathematical models and discuss the process. And eventually, we're coming up to discuss uh, to how do we make inferences with a model that we published uh, a few, well, a couple of years ago now on nature genetics, which I think it puts together all these kind of ideas all together. And then we're gonna go for some practical, um, I'm gonna give you some details about the statistical model, but we're gonna go practical on, on the analysis of real patient data. This is real uh, patient data that has been uh, already analyzed. So essentially in the practicals, we're going to reanalyze this data. So you can go home and if you ever end up having some of this data yourself, you can uh, definitely have an idea of where to start from to make your analysis. Or if you read papers and you like and they give you mutation data, you could download it and analyze it yourself. Okay. Questions? So... Just like uh, one at the end of the day, sorry, I didn't want to spoil that. Um, if you are in general interested in these kind of things, we are organizing a conference in April in Istanbul, which is a satellite event of RECOM, which is a computational cancer biology conference. It happens every year. This year is gonna be organized by me and Gabriel Schweikart. So they had a lecture for the epigenetics part of these classes. So if you develop statistical models that can be applied to the context of cancer, it might be a nice opportunity to come and send your paper. We should have also uh, proceedings to a journal, but that has to be announced over the next uh, few weeks, I would say. Okay? Okay, so thank you. Thank you. So now we have a coffee break, I guess. Uh, Antonio, is there coffee? Ah, okay. So there is coffee upstairs. And then uh, we reconvene here at four for the spotlight talks. Thanks. Mm -hmm.